I think I have. There's also an exhibition at the British Museum on about the Silk Road. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. It sounds very interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so our first speaker is online joining us from, am I right? It's Melbourne. Is that where the University of Wollongong is? Yeah. Okay, well, my Australian uh, geography is clearly not up to scratch. Either way, she's <laughs> <laughs> kindly joining us online from across the world, uh, wherever it is in Australia. Um, so thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, let's just, I think, get started. So, Eve, thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Rika, uh, and thanks for the organizers for accommodating my remote presentation. I, I'm i I'm a bit sad I'm not there in person and take advantage of, obviously, having in face-to-face -face interaction with, ev uh, with everyone. Uh, I'm Eve, and I'm a research fellow at the Australian Centre for Health Engagement, the, uh, Evidence and Values here at the University of Wollongong. Wollongong is uh, a, a city uh, about 90 minutes south of uh, Sydney. My training is in applied philosophy and biomedical ethics, but I'm also a trained clinician. At the moment, my program of research focuses on the ethical, legal, and social implications of using artificial intelligence in healthcare. And what I'll be discussing for this presentation is the are the challenges of datafying race and racism in healthcare artificial intelligence. And in particular, I'd like to share some of our preliminary insights from our policy analysis that looks at how policies on artificial intelligence conceptualize or operationalize the um, race or ethnicity and other similar concepts. As is customary in Australia, I would like to acknowledge the Darawal, Yuin, and Wadi Wadi peoples as the traditional custodians of the country whose sovereignty was never ceded. It's particularly salient to acknowledge that the traditional custodians in Australia experience racial injustice to this day, and my hope is that our work will contribute to correcting this injustice. In terms of outline, the first part a bit long. I'll talk about artificial intelligence in medicine as a background. I'll also discuss algorithmic bias or bias that occurs when AI systems poor perform, uh, poorly perform in, uh, on specific groups. And then I'll talk about uh, our scoping review, which is the basis for our policy analysis and how policies on AI conceptualize and operationalize uh, race. And then I'll discuss the problem of conceptualizing and operationalizing race and similar concepts through the lens of datafication. So artificial intelligence, uh, there's really no set definition. If you look at policies, it's always acknowledged that artificial intelligence is quite broad. A lot of the definitions that you'll see are broad. But at the moment, how we use artificial intelligence as a concept is that it's understood to be a collection of interrelated technologies used to solve problems that would otherwise require human cognition. And even that is still very broad. And artificial intelligence encompasses, sorry, uh, a number of methods, including machine learning, natural language processing, speech recognition, computer vision, and automated reasoning. In healthcare, there is now a lot of current up applications being investigated, but deployment still limited. Uh, at the moment, a lot of jurisdictions are looking at how artificial intelligence differs from existing medical technologies in terms of regulation, accreditation, approval, or review, or monitoring. Uh, so these applications, applications that are under investigation um, include aiding in image-based diagnosis. So radiology and pathology, uh, and to some extent cardiovascular uh, um, cardiology, are some of the fields that are really advanced when it comes to studying the applications of AI in healthcare. 
because of the COVID pandemic, I think that really ramped up the, the, the use of AI in population health, especially when it comes to dis disease surveillance and outbreak prediction. Uh, AI is also being investigated for individual treatment, such as uh, precision med medicine and predicting therapy responses. AI is being, being used in research, assisting in clinical trials, such as participant recruitment, and even drug development um, on the molecular level. Uh, AI has also helped in remote care, such as telehealth and mobile health, with the use of chatbots. And when we talk about algorithmic bias, so over the past few years, there has been increasing concern as well as evidence of bias in a lot of artificial intelligence systems. Uh, AI bias have, the, the concept of AI bias has a technical and social element in its definition. So we can understand bias in a technical or statistical sense as referring to systematic and repeatable errors and and in a social or social technical sense, these errors lead to unfair outcomes, such as prejudice and discrimination of certain groups. Um, AI bias has been noted in a lot of fields outside health, and that includes um, human resource industry, particularly in discriminatory practices of hiring systems that rely on artificial intelligence. Bias has also been demonstrated in policing and surveillance, especially in the United States, where algorithms unfairly replicate existing racist practices in policing. And of course, what we're interested in today are the AI biases that occur in medicine and healthcare. And there's been a lot of studies that show AI systems being found to perform poorly for groups marginalized based on racial or ethnic identities. Um, in terms of causes of algorithmic bias, in a systemic sense, there's a complex cycle of problems that contribute to algorithmic bias. And I know the, the text is quite small, but uh, allow me to go through this by Leslie and Pepin. We have the following key domains of shortcomings and injustices. And in no particular order, we can start with the real world patterns of health inequality and discrimination that lead to unequal access to health care, exclusion of some groups from health care, and even if they are engaged with health care services, members of these underserved and marginalized groups experience poor quality of care. And that leads to, on the top right-hand corner, injustice, inequity, and discriminatory values embedded into data, which may mean either sampling biases that overrepresent or underrepresent some groups, and the inclusion of data from marginalized groups, but these data are of poor quality or typically are not as accurate uh, as um, the ideal data would be. These data sources include medical records, uh, census data, surveys, and other instruments, and increasingly data from tech and communication companies such as Facebook, and Google are being used to train AI applications for healthcare purposes with or without the knowledge of users. And on the lower right hand uh, corner, you have that these um, real world problems lead to AI development um, being unequal because of the AI community not being as diverse. So the I identification of problems and identification of solutions are not as democratic as well. And then on the left um, lower corner, you have application injustices uh, that can exacerbate existing inequities uh, between groups and even discriminatory practices of some AI systems, which again contributes to real world patterns of health inequality and discrimination. And because of the evidence and widespread recognition that bias exists, although this is still always not, um, some people still think bias doesn't exist. Uh, there has been a lot of solutions proposed to address algorithmic bias. Uh, one of these solutions include establishing auditing mechanisms or frameworks to check for and monitor alg algorithmic bias. And one of the early examples of this is Obermeier's uh, algorithmic bias playbook. 
The playbook teaches users how to define, measure, and mitigate racial bias in algorithms. So the playbook has more of a data science slant to it uh, rather than social justice slant. It includes a checklist or cheat sheet. It's designed for organizations adopting or implementing AI systems in healthcare, uh, policymakers and regulators, as well as AI developers who are thinking of uh, generating or producing AI systems for healthcare purposes. It does identify several steps uh, in auditing. It includes inventory, screening, retraining your algorithm, and then preventing uh, bias that you have detected in the algorithm. There are also other more granular solutions typically in, that typically involve either health system-based approaches, data science approaches, and participatory approaches. I'm not sure you can read the, the, the text in the room, apologies, but I'll try to read out uh, what's in there. For example, uh, one group at the very top would uh, states responsible data sharing that involves inclusive health data standards. So these standards or protocols, um, they exist in different jurisdictions. So these are specific guidance. And the idea that um, health data should be more inclusive. Um, and there is, I won't talk about synthetic data sets, but the idea that um, instead of relying on real world data, uh, you can create new data to represent what is missing. And in the very bottom, participant-centered AI development uh, that involves including diverse communities in AI design. So that's at the very early stage of AI development, as well as participatory science in AI development. And with this call of addressing bias, and because of the recognition that a lot of AI bias really is caused by imbalanced data sets. That means that data sets that over-represent some groups. Um, so imbalance in data sets can be described based on what it has. That is usually, it consists of homogenous population. Homogeneity can mean data sets are coming from the same location, say the same state in the US or the same hospital system, or include mostly the same, um, um, the members from the same specific group. Imbalanced data sets can also be described based on what it excludes. So usually, again, some groups that are historically marginalized or underserved are, um, are excluded. Given that problem, we conducted an interview study uh, a couple of years ago as part of a, a project funded by the National Health and Medical Research Council here in Australia. And we aim to canvas the range of strategies stakeholders endorse in attempting to mitigate algorithmic bias and to consider the ethical question of responsibility for algorithmic bias. So briefly, uh, in terms of the methods, it's a qualitative semi uh, it consists it uh, the study design is a qualitative semi-structured interview study. Participants included experts, and the experts can come from um, clinical medicine. Uh, hospital management, AI development, uh, health policy, and regulation. The topic for the interview is quite broad. It involves questions about the ethical, legal, and social implications of AI in healthcare, uh, and algorithmic biases and issues, just one of them. And we conducted the interviews from 2021 to 2022. And it is possible, obviously, that things have changed a lot, especially with the rise of large language models, uh, for example, ChatGPT. And the themes that we found specifically on algorithmic bias uh, include divergent views about whether AI bias is a problem. Um, surprisingly, some people still thought AI bias is not a problem. There were also divergent views about who is responsible for addressing AI bias. A lot of developers feel that they're just working with what they have. And anything to do with addressing injustice it's, is outside the expertise of data scientists or AI developers. And then the third one, which I'll focus on, would be the divergent views about the role of sociocultural identifiers. And that includes information about race or ethnicity when it comes to AI development.
What we found um, were three views, exclusionary, inclusionary, and uncertain views. And when we talk about social cultural identifiers, these include identities based on race or ethnicity, gender or sex sexuality, uh, disability to some extent, and socioeconomic status, among other things. Uh, basically, the usual identities that we know are subject to prejudice or discrimination in healthcare or outside healthcare. And starting with the exclusionary view, this is the position that sociocultural identifiers should be removed from data sets used to train artificial intelligence systems. Uh, this is a small number of participants, and a couple of their justifications include this will prevent risk of assigning disproportionate weight, which reflects existing prejudice or um, problematic assumptions about certain groups. And some believe that sociocultural information, such as race or sexuality, has no impact on disease. It might have impact on the social environment, but not necessarily on the disease, disease progression or treatment. For example, one of our participants stated, if you are, for example, putting the ethnicity of certain groups as a variable, and you put much weight of this book variable, the whole algorithm will be biased towards or away from these groups. But actually, you don't need to put that because these classifications are human classifications. They are not scientific classifications. So for some participants, there is a strong distinction between human or socially constructed classification versus scientific naturalistic classifications. The inclusionary view obviously is the opposite. Uh, for these participants, they believe that we should include information or data about social cultural identities, including race. Uh, and a few of the justifications include, uh, this is in order to increase diversity and representativeness in data sets. Again, directly addressing the problem of imbalanced data sets that result uh, in algorithmic bias. Uh, another justification is to enable healthcare systems to identify un underserved groups. So we have to know who's missing in the data and then obviously rectify that injustice. But there were participants who, who believe that we should include data, but we have to be careful because of the risk of increasing surveillance and even overrepresentation. This is illustrated in the statement. I get the argument of, yes, there is some truth to the argument that the more data you have, the better. But if the outcome of that is that those people will be policed more aggressively, that's really hard to justify. So I think it's quite a complex area. You've got to actually weigh the costs and benefits. Surprisingly, what we found that a lot of participants held the uncertain view, and I guess because of what was sort of hinted at, by the previous example, um, they feel that a lot of social cultural data such as race, sexuality involve fuzzy categories. So categories that are not distinct and data science, computation love binaries. They love distinct categories. Um, it's hard for them to quantify uh, any, any identifier, variable or information that can change over the course of your life or that can be partitioned or that can have uh, different proportions. Some social cultural data are also sensitive and require self-identification. That's why in a lot of industries, uh, these kinds of data are optional um, and there's an option not to reveal. So they feel that social cultural data are just too complex. So at the moment, they understand the need to include, but they just don't know how to do it. And they also know that there's a trade-off if you include or exclude. That's why we did classify them as uncertain view. And this is illustrated by the statement when you say, what about the culturally and linguistically diverse population? Yeah. Which by the way, in Australia is a common um, grouping. Um, right, but for useful purposes, you do need information to be much more granular and that requires people to self-identify. And that can be very tricky. I mean, most people don't simply have one background. They have multiple. I've got 10, so what do you use? So in summary, in terms of the background, we do have a problem. We have a problem of algorithmic bias. 
where AI systems make decisions that systematically disadvantage certain groups of people, in part due to non-representative or imbalanced data sets. Solu solutions are being proposed. There's, there are calls to increase diversity in data sets, for data sets to be more inclusive and to be more representative. But there are challenges, and that includes defining, defining operationalizing diversity, inclusivity, and representativeness. Uh, these are related, but quite distinct concepts. There's also the challenge of operationalizing social cultural and biological identifiers, such as race. Um, and there's the issue of datafication, which I'll get into in a bit. So moving on to the policy analysis, basically how should we operationalize, conceptualize race and data sets for AI development? Our study um, is a scoping review, uh, systematic uh, literature review, but focused on policy documents. And we have two research questions. The first one, what are the recommendations of policy documents to ensure equitable representation of socially constructed categories of difference? For, um, that's race, ethnicity, sex and gender, and socioeconomic status in data sets that could be used to develop AI for clinical applications. The second research question is how do policy documents operationalize, define, and classify socially constructed categories of difference to ensure data equity in the development of AI for clinical applications? Notice that our project um, involves identities outside of race, but for this presentation, I'll focus on insights specifically about race and ethnicity. In terms of methodology, briefly, it's gray literature only uh, involved, um, and these are policy guidelines, policy reports, legislations, and guidance documents. And the documents, we were looking for documents that provide recommendations to ensure equitable representation of socially constructed categories of difference. Uh, in terms of national jurisdictions, we included Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, I'm uh, sorry, I, I duplicated Australia, Canada, and United States, as well as intergovernmental documents from the OECD, uh, EU, WHO, and United Nations. In terms of sources, we looked at Google Advance and select organization websites, both government and non-government. And we included documents published from 2010 to present, which was early this year. Uh, we initially had 716 documents assessed for eligibility and 92 studies were eligible for full text screening, after full text screening. In terms of jurisdictions, we had trends, um, mostly from the U.S. and United Kingdom. In terms of organizations, it's mostly non-government authored publications. And majority were published between 2021 and 2023, which is not surprising. In terms of results, again, to remind the question, how do organizations conceptualize, define, operationalize race and other social categories of difference in the context of big data and artificial intelligence? For general insights, there were wide acknowledgement that race is a protected category or identity and that um, it's subject to prejudice and discrimination and any kind of AI design, development, or, or deployment should make sure that the AI system is not prejudiced or biased against um, groups based on race or ethnicity. We noticed that race and ethnicity were used interchangeably or are considered as twin concepts. So if you see the word race, usually it's followed by ethnicity uh, when documents, uh, when there are lists of protected categories mentioned in the documents. There's also wide acknowledgement that we still have limited data on racial identity, especially in the context of healthcare. Uh, I'll then talk. Of, I'll now talk about approaches to conceptualizing race. We found at the moment, again, this is preliminary. Two general approaches. The first one is self-identification, um, and a subtype is self-identification of a specific group or identity. Uh, this is illustrated by an Australian document. Um, this is from the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. I forgot the name of their counterpart in the UK, but they are uh, their role involves providing accreditation for hospitals and providing standards for a lot of healthcare practices. So there is an existing standard or protocol on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, status. 
And here, for example, in this document, identifying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Again, this is based on self-identification. Uh, usually you have that standard question, are you or is the person of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander origin? And the standard response options include no, yes, Aboriginal, yes, Torres Strait Islander, yes, both, and decline to answer. Another example of the approach of self-identification, it's a little bit different. Um, this kind of self-identification provides multiple choices of groups or categories. And one document from the United States refer to uh, existing protocols and standards in the United States, stating that all health-related data collections are mandated to conform to the U.S. Office of Management and Budgets government-wide standard, which is called Statistical Policy Directive Number 15, Standards for Maintaining, Collecting, and Presenting Federal Data on Race and Ethnicity. So it is in the policy. So this page, uh, the one you see on the right, again, the texts are too small. Um, these are standardized templates on how people can self-identify. And it does state select all that apply. So they can choose at least one or more. And the categories include American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, uh, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Middle Eastern or North African, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and White. And for all those general categories, there are subcategories. The second approach to that we found to conceptualizing race is providing authoritative definitions or explicit definitions. We haven't really found definitions of race. The ones that we found are definitions of ethnicity. This is illustrated by a document from New Zealand, uh, which alluded to the ethnicity data protocols. In New Zealand, Stats NZ um, is a, responsible for the definition of ethnicity across all of government. So this definition applies to government services, including healthcare services provided by or funded or provided by the government. And the definition of ethnicity contained is contained in the document statistical standard for ethnicity. Um, to read their definition, ethnicity is the ethnic group or groups that people identify with or feel they belong to. It is a measure of cultural affiliation as opposed to race, ancestry, nationality, or citizenship. It is self-perceived and people can belong to more than one ethnic group. And they have provided several characteristics. Um, these include a common proper name, one or more elements of common culture, which need not be specified, but may include religion, customs, or language. Uh, unique community interests, feelings and actions, and a shared sense of um, a shared sense of common origins or ancestry and a common geographic origin. So ethnicity, uh, at least in, New in the New Zealand context, government context, is quite broad, and it can include religious uh, groups based on religion, based on language groups, and based on cultural groups. Uh, one document we found from the United Kingdom from the Institute of Glo Global Health Innovation is a short definition of ethnicity as a form of collective identity that draws on notions of shared ancestry, cultural commonality, geographical origins, and shared biological features. Um, so the biological features is not really present in NZ, but it's present here in this document. Sorry, poor animation. But some of the challenges and opportunities that we've found um, at the moment based on the documents is variations in policy on whether to collect data on race. These are ongoing discussions in Canada and Australia, um, whether to explicitly mandate uh, any kind of organiza organization that collects data. There's also variations in racial categories or classification across jurisdictions. Uh, a lot of the categories that exist in the U.S. are not really common, for example, in Australia and New Zealand. There's also tendency to collapse racial or ethnic minorities into one group. Uh, in Australia, it's referred, uh, they, the, the groups are referred to as culturally and linguistically diverse groups. And in the U.K., it's BAME, Black and minority ethnic groups. There's also the challenge, which is which we are very happy to see, 
a lot of policy documents are, are acknowledging the challenge of intersectionality, that you cannot just look at one um, category of difference or one identifier independent of other identifiers, that a lot of these identifiers or identities intersect with each other. And the challenge there is how to, again, make sure that you take that into the equation when you're developing your AI system. Uh, if we don't face these challenges, there will be problems in terms of transportability and, and transferability. So this is the problem. Um, there is poor effectiveness and safety when it comes to transferring an AI program that was developed in one jurisdiction or country and then transferred to another jurisdiction or country. And of course, there's also the accuracy problem. Not all individuals in groups have similar experiences. <clears throat> and the challenge there is how granular can you really get? Um, that's why a lot of people um, would caution against collapsing racial or ethnic minorities into one group. Because again, each individual and also each group don't have sim um, similar experiences. So in summary, in terms of our preliminary insights from the policy analysis, there's general agreement that race and ethnicity is a protected characteristic. Um, there's also general agreement that there's risk of race-based discrimination as a real problem for AI systems in healthcare. Um, there is increasing agreement that there we need diverse data sets, but what is missing still, guidance on how to operationalize race that could be understood by different stakeholders, including policymakers, clinicians, AI developers, health consumers, and patients. Um, in terms of our analysis, we wanted to frame and understand this problem through the lens of datafication and basically ask the question, so what can we learn from the history of datafication and what are the affordances, limitations, and potential harms of using datafication to understand the problem of race in the context of data, big data, and artificial intelligence in healthcare. So datafication refers to the processes or ways of knowing that because of big data, massive volume of information collected by digital technologies, um, because of uh, big data, we are finding new means of understanding complex social processes and behaviors. Um, and datafication requires at least two key processes. First is how to measure that which we wish to datafy. And the second is how to record the measurement. There's uh, a number of normative positions. The neutral position is that datafication is merely a descriptive process, nothing more. It's a thing that happens in the world. There's the more evangelical uh, position. Datafication is a desirable ideal, the idea that big data will set, save humanity. They um, these individuals are referred to as big data fundamentalists and their ideology is big data fundamentalism. The idea that big data is the only reliable and true source of meaningful insights. And of course, you have the critical positions. Datafication will magnify existing problems. Um, uh, scholars such as Timnit Gebru and Kate Crawford, for example, have criticized datafication and big data and how they are really replicating existing existing oppressive practices. So in terms of data, so datafication of health has been undergoing, um, I think for the past few years now, because of obviously with digitization of medical records, um, with development of emerging, with, with of new technologies, such as wearable technologies. We have our mobile phones and other communication technologies recording a lot of our physiological data. There's other types of surveillance systems, and there's also data from uh, private companies. Um, because of that, there's an ever-increasing collection and analysis of massive amounts of quantified information about health for healthcare purposes. But the datafication of health also means blurring the boundaries between health or health-related data and non-health data. So there's now an ongoing axiom that everything is health data. Every interaction you have with your mobile phone can might provide insight on your overall health or well-being. 
the way you walk, the um, when you cross red light, uh, people are assuming or correlating with some kind of health outcome. Again, there's also the expansion of sources of health-related data from medical records to mobile and wearable technologies to even online purchases or to your email account. So these could be sources of health-related data. Now, going on to the issue of datification of race. So datification of health and datification of race, I would say, are parallel phenomena if you want to understand how we can address the problem of diversifying data sets. So here, datification of race uh, means gathering increase in gathering of information to do with racial or ethnic identity. It involves creation and imposition of categories uh, to do with race, ethnicity, and other kinds of categorization. Some from um, a lot of experts or some experts from critical data studies argue that we need to understand that datafication is less about capturing or documenting, but about construction or reification of fuzzy racial categories. So they're also they're already starting from a very critical uh, position. Um, I would also argue and add to the literature that datafication of race. Um, there's a lot of ongoing phenomena or long-standing phenomena that's been going on in healthcare with regards to race that contributes to datification. And one of these um, is the medicalization of race, which refers to the phenomenon of framing race as a medical or medically adjacent concept. Uh, a lot of healthcare professionals see race um, as a way to categorize risk of disease, response to treatment, or even um, understand health-seeking behavior. Uh, a related concept, but I would say different, would be biolog biologization of race, uh, the overemphasis on the physical or the visible, as well as biological characteristics shared by racial or ethnic groups. And the third one, which I would say is a subtype of the second one, would be geneticiz geneticization of race, which is a more insidious type of biologization where racial identity is framed as rooted in one's genes. Um, geneticization specifically uh, is enjoying a lot of popularity at the moment because of several services that exist. For example, one website um, called Family History Hosting uh, or Ethnicity Calculator. This website provides services, uh, provides a service that calculates the cultural ethnicity of a person uh, and supposedly the values derived from ethnic or national origin values assigned to the subjects they call subjects, uh, recent ancestors. Okay. And then you may have heard of companies like Ancestry DNA, where you're asked to send them either saliva, uh, usually a saliva sample, and then they will provide you and predict your genetic ethnicity. So they refer to it explicitly as genetic ethnicity, and they provide proportions, for example, 10% African, 20% Asian. Some are more specific. So these kinds of services that are direct-to-consumer services kind of contributes to the idea that racial categories are cleanly classified, and that they can be identified through your genes. And when we use datafication as a lens or as a, or as a framework, there are obviously a lot of concerns. One of them is that datafication as a process is historically and politically problematic. A lot of um, experts from critical data studies point to datafication arising from military, from the military industry. And datafication has always been about surveillance and control. There's also concern that datafication refights problematic categories rooted in oppressive ideologies, such as racialization. And datafication relies on categories decided by a select few. And one of the things that we're looking at, obviously, is datafying racism, because a lot of people understand datafying racism in two ways. So in a positive light, datafying racism means datafying experiences and impacts of racism. So even if we don't cleanly define or conceptualize race, maybe we can datafy, quantify, and capture experiences and impacts of racism. 
But the negative um, understanding of datafying racism is that datafying racism means you're formally embedding racist ideologies and oppressive practices into your data sets that will be used to train um, AI systems. And that's really problematic in any industry outside of healthcare. So in summary, there's general agreement that AI systems can be biased against marginalized groups. And there's also general agreement about the need to increase diversity in data sets used to train AI. But the fundamental problem remains, if we want to diversify data sets, how do we appropriately, justly, and ethically operationalize race, ethnicity, and other categories of difference that are subject to prejudice? Again, thank you so much, and uh, looking forward to your questions, comments, or feedback. Um, I'm going to turn my camera on so you might be able to see the people in the room somewhat. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for questions, so questions, please. There's one here. And for those online, actually, um, I should say, if you want to ask a question, please either raise your hand, and then I'll just tell you when to unmute yourself or type it into the box. Question. Thank, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Eve. Um, more things to discuss um, for me personally than will happen in this moment. Um, but just to say, I think part of what I take to be exciting about what you've presented um, is not just the the stuff that's turned up in the propositional content, if you will, of what you've just shared, but the implications um, for a number of conversations. So to that end, um, without necessarily stipulating what I'd like you to, to, to maybe reflect on in this moment, um, I'm thinking, here's a first short comment bit about Margaret Master Masterman, um, a pioneering um, philosopher, linguist, polymath um, at Cambridge in the last century, who, um, if I haven't misremembered, actually was decades ahead of her time um, in terms of the thinking, and I've now got large language models specifically within AI, but one of the things that I take to be not widely discussed in terms of her legacy that is relevant to this conversation was her fear that as what was what we now take for granted as artificial intelligence proliferated, the lack of really rigorous and anthropologically valent approaches um, to linguistic theory, the absence of that and the disinterest in that in the work um, in pioneering artificial intelligence was going to have an impact on ethical outcomes um, of AI. And it seems in 2024, she was I'm sure correct. And to that end, I'm wondering about two areas about information science um, mm -hmm. in different modalities and ways in which that the scientizing, if you will, of information, then the wider sort of disciplinary um, expansions of information, where types of thinking about the challenges that um, data sets as a phenomenon will face, how might those be informed and questions that you're asking by types of themselves, anti-racist and anti-colonial approaches to information science that it's not clear we see anything of at present. And then the second thing is the so-called, I've seen this carefully, science of intelligence. So intelligence mm. has become a, um, a field of its own in ways that obviously relate to AI but I'm not sure I've yet seen that much work that really maps what is taken to be prototypical intelligent science that interrogates um, what artificial intelligence um, is claiming in the ways that it makes claims. So it, however you feel able to you know, speculate, speculate, respond to any of that, um, would be really grateful and thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that question. Wonderful, um, both suggestion and question into one that's really helpful for the way we're looking at our project. Uh, one of the things I'm quite optimistic about looking at policy documents, again, it's different looking at policy documents and how those policies um, or text in the documents translate into practice. 
But one of the things that we have found in terms of trends in policy documents is the increasing recognition of the value of interdisciplinary work. Um, we noticed that uh, documents way back, probably before 2015, there's less recognition. And the reason why I'm optimistic about that, especially with intergovernmental documents like the United Nations and even European Commission, there's increasing recognition of the value of social sciences and humanities when it comes to understanding the ethical, legal, and social implications of artificial intelligence. I think the idea that information science, data science, or even science per se has the last say or has the, I guess, holds the upper position over social sciences and humanities, I think that's being broken down. So for me, that's uh, that's a great opportunity for us to share knowledge and assumptions, especially when it comes to when we spoke to a lot of AI developers and they have problems with the concepts of race. Uh, of course, they are not aware that there's a long-standing scholarship with these kinds of concepts. So I think that kind of sharing of information and sharing of expertise is happening more. And we are seeing that a lot of the committees that produce policy documents already involve different expertise, not just from the usual um, groups like clinical medicine or AI and technology community. Uh, they are now involving ethicists, social scientists, uh, anthropologists, um, SDS people. So I think that's uh, that's a good sign. And I also think there, because of the problems that people are realizing when it comes to artificial intelligence, people are more critical. Uh, peop, um, so there's that combination of being critical about the tech bros and the Silicon Valley community. So I think before they were not as exposed to either media coverage or direct engagement with regular citizens. But I think the walls surrounding the tech companies and the tech community is being broken down and people are highlighting and raising concerns. I think that's another good sign where scholars from social human social sciences and humanities can actually contribute. And for people like us who are working um, in interdisciplinary spaces can actually sort of help manage and adjudicate and connect um, different disciplines together. So that's me being optimistic. I know that's different from what's really happening out there, but I think I, I think there are reasons to be optimistic and there are still a lot of opportunities to share knowledge and to share understandings. And again, I'll look at Margaret um, Masterman's work. Um, I'm not as familiar, but thank you so much. Great. Um, Arjun first, and then we'll go to Ioni. Hello, am I visible? You are. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting. My kind of general question is, okay, so, I mean, this is specifically about race and issues around racism within this topic, but the pushback may be something like, well, there's going to be a trade-off here, right? So we don't require, we shouldn't require algorithms to be perfectly equitable and anti-racist tools. That's not really what they're designed to do, they're meant to be accurate predictors. Um, and if they're performing that function well, then there's some kind of trade-off between, you know, this maybe let's say in radiology, this diagnostic tool, which accurately diagnoses early malignancies or cancers, it may perform less well in certain ethnicities because those ethnicities were not properly represented in the original data set. But it's still better than a doctor doing it because doctors are racists, right? So it's still, a, you can say, yes, okay, fine. It's not, a, it's not an ideal system, but it's a move, it's a step forward. And therefore it's still overall on balance, a good thing. 
right? So how how does that kind of calculus <laughs> play out in the policy yeah. world? Mm, that has been, we have found it also in our interview study, they have raised that same issue about trade-off. But again, in terms, I guess the perspective of are we going to allow injustices just because it works for the majority of population for a lot of people that's an outdated um, perspective um, because it's not inevitable and a lot of people already acknowledge it's not inevitable it's just that the data is not there um, but whether it's I'm not here to decide for everyone but the idea that you might increase the gap the health outcomes because it works for some groups or majority of individuals. I think that's up for debate. But what we are really interested in with our project is for people who propose um, increasing diversity of data sets to make sure that AI systems work well or at least close to equal to every group, then how do we represent, document, and capture identifiers such as race? when it's such a difficult concept to navigate. But that's an ongoing conversation. Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, so I have generally a very, very simple question, probably. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I would love to read more about your results. But I was wondering if you also analyze issues uh, connected with the unsupervised language models, uh, which pr sometimes produce s results that can be aligned with some known ethno-racial classifications, but usually there is this, you know, black box issue there that we have no idea why they produce those results. Uh, so I was wondering if you also an uh, analyze that kind of problems. Um, not so in, in the previous project we did, um, but not for this one. So for the for the scoping for the policy analysis, um, it's something that we we know of. It's recognized the idea of black box where we are familiar with we know the input and the output, but we don't know how the AI system arrived at the output. Um, one of the interesting things that's relevant for our work when it comes to that issue, there was a study in. Western Australia or Southern Australia, I forgot, but they use data sets to look at x-rays. And for some reason, the AI system was able to um, was was able to identify the racial identity of the patient, um, even if that information is not there. And they don't know because it's just an x-ray image. So they're they're not really sure how the AI system was able to do that quite accurately, even if the racial um, information about the racial identity of the patient was not included in the data set. Uh, so that's an issue. The idea that even if you want to remove racial categories, they are there exists what people refer to as proxies. So other characteristics that track along racial uh, lines, for example, zip codes um, in a lot of jurisdictions, because of informal segregation, zip codes are associated with racial groups. So even if you don't include information about race, but you include information about zip codes or addresses, then an AI system might infer. There's also other proxies, proxies such as language spoken at home, um, or even religion or nationality. So there are a lot of proxies, and at times because of black box algorithms, we don't know exactly what the correlation is. And if the AI system is responding to a problematic category instead of the category or the variable that it's meant to analyze. But yeah, that's something that's quite adjacent, but and not really the focus of our, our uh, current project, but it's something that we acknowledge exists and that can actually compound the problem. So just one simple follow up. Uh, there, I think there are some interesting uh, papers when it comes to like methodology of um, biomedical research and racism about um, multi-variable uh, and intersectional models analyzing data. And 
it goes like it connects this, the problem I mentioned with uh, your research and the problem of intersectionality of race. I think some of them could, could be could be useful for your for your research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, uh, Jim O'Brien. Uh, I, I just had one quick question. Um, it was uh, asking you to clarify something you said uh, during your bit about datifying race. Mm. And I don't remember who the actors that you were referring to, but but you commented that they create data to fill in gaps. Yeah. Does that ring a bell? And can you expound on that? All right. Uh, so I, I think I mentioned about synthetic data sets. Um, so it's not mm -hmm. it's more on the idea that you can impute non-existing. So there are different ways of doing synthetic data sets. So you can create a digital double of someone that exists in the world, or you can create a completely fictional or manufactured individual that has different variables or health variables. You can have randomized um, assign assigning of value for these synthetic data sets. But in so many ways, they are, they are based in reality. So you're creating fictional sets of data that might reflect, for example, things that you will expect in a minoritized groups. Um, and then use those fictional or synthetic synthetic data sets to train your algorithm. So that's one way of uh, addressing the gaps uh, where you have data sets that don't have information from underserved groups or marginalized groups. So that's being proposed and that's being investigated. And again, like people are looking at the, because there's a, both a practical and an epistemological issue. Are synthetic data sets reliable? Um, are they comparable to real data sets based on real individuals or persons? Um, yeah, I hope that clarifies. It's a really interesting field. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Um, we've run out of questions perfectly on time. Um, so thank you so much, Eve, um, uh, for your great presentation. We'll just do a quick. Thank you um, so much. And thanks, thanks for everyone. joining so late online.